And God, we just thank you the knowledge that you are with us and that you are for us. And so, Father, I just pray for our study this morning that you would bless it. I pray, Father, for this time that our nation has set aside to honor those who have gone before us, who have given their lives, Lord. We see the example that you set in the scriptures that freedom is anything but free. There's always a price to be paid. And so, Father, based upon the sacrifice that you have made that ultimately set us free both here in this life and the life to come, we once again remember those, Lord, who fought on the battlefields and gave, well, paid the ultimate price. But now, Father, as you have set us free from death, we rejoice in, God, the goodness of, of all that you are and all that you continue to do. So as we open your word, we just pray again that you would teach us and instruct us for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn your neighbor and tell him, Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1, and if you arrived here today without a Bible, there should be one in front of you underneath the seat. If there's not and you need a Bible, if you raise your hands, the ushers will bring one to you. Does anybody need a Bible? There's one over there to, to my left. As you're turning there, um, if you're a part of the prayer chain, um, we've been keeping you up to date on what's going on. You've heard this prayer going out for many weeks. A member of our church, Jim Simmons, um, he's been having heart issues and came, the doctors came to the realization that his heart was only working 5 to 12 percent of its capacity. Well, he was up for a heart transplant and there's just a battery of tests to take. Then you have to go before a board of doctors. He's part of Kaiser, so Kaiser, and then they vote to make sure that you're able to withstand the uh, transplant, that you have no other sicknesses. There's just a list of qualifications. And if you pass that, then Kaiser uses Cedar Sinai to do their heart transplant. You have to go to, before a board, not physically, but as file, before a board of 40 physicians in order to qualify for that as well. Well, we found out last Friday, not just the day before yesterday, but the Friday before that Jim did qualify. And so we had been praying in that he had been waiting for a heart, and at some point, I well, it must have been either Thursday or Friday morning, somebody passed away. We had been praying for the person whose heart Jim was going to get, and that that person was alive at that moment and probably didn't know that the day of his death was, was coming. Well, God provided a heart for Jim on Friday morning. Yeah, and... Um, it was kind of an all-day process, um, even though the heart's there and, and you know, the, the appearance and it checks all the boxes, they still have to deliver it to the hospital. And once it gets to the hospital, which they flew it in by helicopter, once it gets to the hospital, they make the final determination that it's a good fit for, for Jim, and they did that. And so Friday afternoon, really Friday evening, it was only, it was amazing, it's only about a three-hour surgery, but Jim now has a new heart. There's still plenty to pray for. Um, he had the surgery, as I said, on Friday night. Saturday morning, he was slow waking up. There's just a whole, you know, they put your body into paralysis, and there's just all these kinds of things, so your body has to come back. Uh, your organs have to start kicking back in. It took him longer than usual to wake up, but he has woken up. Matter of fact, my wife and I, we went up to Cedars yesterday afternoon and visited him. Um, he's obviously <laughs> incapacitated. Um, he has a ventilator down his throat, um, but when we walked in, his, he could open his eyes and he would nod his head in response. I was by the side of his bed and my wife was by the other side and he grabbed both of our hands and 
Um, he acknowledged that we were there, and you could communicate with him as hard as it was. So right now, our prayers need to be a couple of different things here. First, that he would get to the point that they would be able to take the ventilator out of his throat. Uh, you can imagine having that thing. D says it's like breathing, trying to breathe through a straw. And then secondly, his kidneys haven't yet kicked back into operation. And so just lift that up in prayer as well. Um, before I came up here, I asked my wife, and she said they were. They're watching service right now, so we can say hi to Jim and that we're praying for him. <laughs> um, it, it's an amazing thing in that when they remove the heart from the deceased, they, the person has to die first. Then they put him back on life support in order to keep the organs going. They take the organ out, in this particular case, the heart, and they put the heart on ice, or I, I don't know if that terminology is correct, but it's cold. And, you know, I'm thinking, okay, well, yeah, it's got to be that way to preserve it and to bring it through. But also they put it on because the heart will continue to beat by itself. And, and they put it on ice, again, for lack of a better term, uh, in order to keep it from beating. You know, they don't want it to beat with nothing in it and, and all. It's not good for it. And so they transport it that way. And then usually, sometimes they have to shock it, but usually when they put it in the patient and it warms up, it starts beating again. And this is just an amazing thing. I mean, you look at that. Who designed that? Who thought about it? It, it didn't happen by chance. And, and yeah, it, it's just an absolute miracle. And, and it's this God, because we are told in first, oh, I'm sorry, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, that everything is created. It was created by Jesus Christ. And then the Apostle John tells us in 1 John chapter 1, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, this life was manifest, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard. We declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And ultimately here, verse 4, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full that Jim would be able to have joy just in the knowledge that his creator has thought of him, his creator has provided for him. And my encouragement to Jim last night was just, just take victory in each little step, and we need to pray accordingly. But this is our text for today, and, and we need to understand it was, through, it was through the Apostle John's witness and how he experienced Christ that he was able to convey through his witness, the reality of Jesus Christ, and for the purpose of having the, the recipient having joy. And it works the same way with us. How have you experienced Christ? Well, you haven't experienced him the exact same way with, that John was able to, but you have the more sure word of God that you are able to experience him to the same degree that John did. And then the same thing that John did to tell others of what you have experienced. Why? So that their joy may be full as well. John uses the word joy just one time in this epistle, but it's important to know that the lack of joy in a Christian's life, well, that was the reason for him writing it. And again, I, I really see across the landscape of the church today that this is an effective message for us all. Because as we looked at, look at our society, just even in general, there's no joy. There's no joy whatsoever. Matter of fact, you pick up the newspaper, you go on the internet, whatever it might be, and, and you look at the things going on across the world, or at least what is being reported. How could you possibly have joy in this life apart from the knowledge of Jesus Christ and what Christ has done for you and the future that you have? And it's that joy that goes before us to strengthen us in this life and to motivate us in our witness, but also that's what others are able to see that in this difficult day, in these dire straits, that we are able to have joy. That, that, inner, that inner reality of what has come about our life because of what Jesus Christ has achieved upon the cross and what came through the witness again, just as John did here, but 
for so many, for so many years, for over close to 2,000 years, and once again arrived at the doorstep of our spiritual hearts. The way John is going to achieve his purposes and how he is achieving achieving his purposes and the reason for his purposes is to aid, encourage, and establish the church, that the church would be strong and the church would continue to move forward. The Apostle John knew that joy was not something manufactured but a byproduct, byproduct of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And as we've come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, who comes and dwells inside of us? Christ, but but the Holy Spirit. And how do you know? Well, the Holy Spirit, we're told in Ephesians chapter 1, that the Holy Spirit is given to us as a guarantee. That's God's wedding ring, if you will, or maybe I should say engagement ring. This is the, the, the proof and the surety of the promise that God has given us, that as Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, there we will be one day also. So we have the Spirit. And we're also told in Galatians chapter 5 that if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, there's going to be certain fruit that you produce, and it's going to be love, and there's going to be those the, the, the rest of the expressions or maybe the, the realities of that love that is within you. And one of them is going to be joy. And so I've got to ask you today, are you living a life that has joy? Are you living a joyful life? If not, you're at the right place. And so you must first, because really John's chief intent here, and I have nothing for you unless you're a born-again believer. Again, it's not about being a Christian, nor in the Bible does it say to be a Christian, but Jesus said very poignantly in John chapter 3, you must be born again. And so unless a person is born again, this really doesn't attain. You've got to do the elementary things first. But if you are born again and you lack joy, a Christian that lacks joy inevitably will be lacking in some aspect of their Christian lives. As a matter of fact, the purpose of biblical counseling is to bring joy back into that life, to find out what's missing, to find out where they've gone askew, and to bring them back into a a right place in their relationship with God, and it's then that joy is going to return. Matter of fact, if you look a little bit further down in verses 8 through 10, John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, as we'll see in a little bit, sin is that going to be that in a born-again believer's life that robs him of joy. Verse 9 says, though, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so that would be... A perfect example is somebody who is contrary to the word, who is the person who John is talking about here, that person would not have joy in his life. And John, John doesn't just want you to have joy, he wants your joy to be full. He wants your cup to overflow. He wants your life to be so full of joy that it flows into the lives of others. And so again, this is a reality, and this is a promise that God has for us. And if we're not experiencing this to the fullest, if you do not have joy that is overflowing, and this is joy in the midst of hardship, this is joy as you're in in, in Cedar sinai with a tube stuck down your throat, just out of surgery, but still able to have joy. This is joy as we go through whatever the difficulties are that we go through in life. This is joy, again, the expression of God working through, the reality of God working through our lives. In Psalm 16, verse 11, it says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In John 16, 24, it says, Until now you have asked nothing in my name, asking you receive, that your joy may be full. And so again, this is a desire of God that we would have this joy. Again, to have this, not, not, not to be stoic, not, not to just get through life, not just to endure, but to have life and live life to its fullest. To, to be able to have a relationship as far as the marital relationship. And to understand that it's a difficult thing. Marriage is one of the hardest things that I have done. You have two imperfect people trying to cohabitate together. 
But in the midst of all of that, in the midst of working it all out and, and whatnot, that, that we would have joy. Most of you don't know, but my wife and I, we've been separated. <laughs> Not like you think. <laughs> you don't have to go to another church next week. Um, we were at a uh, pastor's conference this week, and then when we got back, it was down in Palm Springs. Uh, my son met us there and took my wife back to Yucca Valley, and I came back here, and so from uh, Wednesday till yesterday, we've been separated, and, you know, you come home and kind of got the house all to myself, can eat whatever I want, <laughs> and I can mess things up and not have to clean them up, at least until an hour before she comes home. <laughs> but all that's a big party for a little bit, but then you, there's the emptiness there, a and, and then there's the reunion, and it's not, you know, hallelujah, she's back, but it's just the joy the joy of, of her being back and the joy of the fellowship that we had. And the first thing that we were able to do when she came back was to drive up to go visit Jim. And just the joy, it's one of the things that my wife and I enjoy a lot, is just to drive together and just that time together. And do we have this rich, constant conversation? Well, to a degree, yes, but to a degree, no. Sometimes it's just the joy of our presence with one another because God has caused the two to become one. And when we're separated, there's just something that is, is missing. The joy to do ministry together, to be able to minister to Jim and, and Dee. The joy to go and to have dinner on the way back. And, and, you know, just the joy to be with your spouse. The joy with their kids. See, if, if marriage is one of the hardest things, then raising kids is the hardest thing that we've ever done together. And, and, and you go through all the difficulty and all of that, but we just had Mother's Day and the joy of having the family. My daughter wasn't, one of my daughters wasn't there, but the joy of having family there, it's just such a good thing. And then there's the joy of grandchildren, which is joy complete. That's joy overflowing. But I need to have that relationship first with my Savior before I can experience joy in all of these other relationships. God, <clears throat> excuse me, God has designed us to find joy in conversation. So once again, with my wife, I have joy in the conversations that we are able to have. For the Lord, or with the Lord, it's the joy that I have with him that I pray I can speak to him, and I know I have assurance that he hears me. So with a young couple, maybe it's I love you, or to hear those words for the first time, and do you remember when you heard those words for the first time from somebody who was sincere about it? And, and just the joy that welled up inside of you that that person loves me. The voice of a child as that child calls to you. And, you know, I just love hearing the words, Papa, that's what my grandchildren call me. And there's just joy in that. Compassion of a friend who cares. And there's joy in that as well. So speaking as we speak to God, we are able to have joy within our lives. In John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full, a constant theme throughout John's writing. God has designed us as well that we would find joy in the word of God. To attempt to find joy in any other words or any other philosophies is just going to lead you down a path that has absolutely nothing else to offer. And so I, I was thinking about that. My wife and I were talking about it, and I was talking to it about uh, with Sean just before service about the heart thing once again. And, and this heart, as it continues to beat, and they have to cool it down in order to not damage it. They transport it, and then they put it inside of a human being, and it starts beating again. And again, there's just a picture of the presence of God that is in that. And I just made the comment, how could any heart doctor possibly be an atheist? I mean, again, you're seeing the hand of God in humanity. Learn to see the hand of God in simplicity. Learn to see the hand of God in, in just the beauty of, of God's creation. To see the hand of God in your relationships, however they may be. To see God and God's hand in, in just your life as a whole. When you learn to see that, then you're going to truly experience the joy to learn the lostness of the world. There's no doubt about that because in all relationships, we make ourselves vulnerable, but with the exception of a relationship with Christ, but just to 
understand the truthfulness of God's word and how God's word continues to work in and through our lives even today. Sin, sin will steal your joy and always produce sorrow. The Bible tells us that, yeah, there is a temporary pleasure in sin, but only for a season. And I'd have to imagine that Moses at some point came to the realization of this. He came to a crossroads in his life at some point when he realized that I I can go the way of the world. And this is before God met him in the wilderness. I can go the way of the world. And he had a pretty good, from the world's perspective, he had a pretty good choice that was set before him as one of the most powerful men in the most powerful and richest nations in the world. Or I can seek after God. God, again, that he had not personally met, but he had heard through the word of God as it was passed through the generations. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 25, it says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Now, when it says passing passing pleasures of sin, there is pleasure in sin. It would be foolishness of me to deny that because y'all are sinners and you've all experienced that. And I am too. But we understand that no joy comes from sin. There's nothing that is lasting that comes from it. There's nothing from sin that has ever added in a positive light to any of our lives. To be apart from godly fellowship, to be apart from prayer, to be apart from God's word is to experience a joyous, joyless life. A few people in history, in unbelief, Voltaire, a philosopher, was an unbeliever of the most pronounced type. He wrote, I wish I had never been born. Because all of his philosophies, once again, they just simply led to a joyless existence. Trying to explain things according to human intellect will rob you of your joy. As far as pleasure, Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure if anyone did. He wrote, the worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. Again, there was that inner turbulence of life that although he sought after so many pleasures, each one left him wanting and left him empty. And he realized there's no value in any of this. As far as riches, Jay Gould. Jay Gould was a railroad man in the 1800s. He was very rich and he was also very ruthless, cheating people out of property and doing what was ever necessary to make a buck. He was an American millionaire, had plenty of riches, but when dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. He realized with all that he had, something was still missing. As far as position and fame, Lord Baconsfield, he was a prime minister of England in the 1800s. He enjoyed more than his share of both, but he wrote, youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, old age a regret. There's something missing. He's coming to the same conclusion as the preacher did in Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. All is just grasping for the wind. There's no substance in these things. In military glory, Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day, but having done so, he wept because there were no more victories to be found. Matter of fact, the night that he wept and cried out was the night that he ended up dying and very empty life. So all of these people who have achieved great glory, all these people who have achieved great wealth, relationships, and all of these things, they found all of these things to not contain the joy that they so desperately sought. And we see this exemplified today in the people that we prop up, we as a society prop up as our heroes or, or maybe our inspiration. You see the latest actor who takes his life because he achieved everything that he had ever wanted and worked so hard but found that there was only loneliness. The athlete who achieves the accolades and the rewards and realizes, well, the only joy that I'm able to have is going to be based upon what I'm able to do next. And if I can't repeat what I have just done, then I'm just going to be a has-been and at some point just simply discarded. 
the politician who makes all of these promises and will even, as a, a, a the citizens of this country, as we elect a new president in, we expect so many times for that person to do the work of God, and when he fails, we bring the next one in, never able to find joy, because it is God who is seated upon the throne. It is God who is in the position of authority, and it's God and it is only God that we will be able to find lasting joy in. And without that relationship, or if we sever that relationship through not praying, through not being in God's word, through not uh, fellowshipping or allowing sin to enter in, then we are not going to have joy in our lives as well. Now remember, do not confuse joy with happiness. The two are completely different. Happiness is based on circumstances, and circumstances can change daily. How many times have you been really happy only to end up being really sad in a moment? As far as our joy, our joy is supernaturally kept by God. It's supernaturally kept by God as we seek after the Lord. Again, verse 4, And these things we write to you, that your joy, your joy may be full. <clears throat> what are the things that he is talking about? Well, these are the things that need to be taken care of to maintain Christian joy. And first, they have to start, as I said before, with our salvation. The details of our faith that we can neglect and cause and rest in our, our lives. Well, we see the example to the negative of those who have gone before us. Elijah knew that God was greater than the false gods of man, but he forgot that he was greater than even this Queen Jezebel, and he lost his joy. As we see the things that are going on in the world with these nations, and they're talking about war now with I, uh, Iran, and you see the, the madman that is in North Korea, and, and just everything else that's going on on top of all of that, my God is greater than all of that. Again, as that great philosopher at Calvary Chapel, Ontario, Mrs. Pastor Mike said, things are not spiraling out of control, they're falling into place. And I was just even thinking about that. I don't remember what I was reading this morning, but one of the headlines, and I was just thinking, well, there's another check. That's one of the things that's supposed to happen during the end times. And so we are constantly headed in that direction. And if we're headed in that direction, that's okay, because God is greater than all of this, and you are a child of God. To be kept by God, your joy should be full. Elijah, you just experienced this huge victory over these prophets of Baal. And you emerged victorious, and they're slain at that point. And this one woman, and it doesn't matter that it's a woman or whoever, but this one person makes a threat, and then everything falls apart. Keep in mind, who holds your hand? Keep in mind, who holds you in his hand? Keep in mind that God is always in control. Even as we were singing in that last song, if God is for us, who can be against us? And remember, when a question is asked in the scriptures, 90% of the time the answer is to the negative. If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Nobody. Nobody whatsoever. God's will will come to pass. That ought to spark joy in our heart as well. David, King David, David, a man after God's own heart, still an imperfect man. He sinned, and he needed to come back to repentance. We, we took some time on a Thursday night and studied Psalm 51. It bears reading again if you have an opportunity this week. But that's David's psalm of repentance, to forsake his sin and to come back to that right relationship with God. Now, why, why was that so necessary? Because he was living a miserable life based upon the sins that he committed. What sins? It doesn't matter. Sin is, is sin. And, and when we, I don't want to say fall into sin because that made it sound like it's an accident, but when we sin, there's going to be that feeling of separation from God. That's what God uses to spark the necessity to repent within our hearts. Are you feeling separated from God in your Christian life? Do inventory. Is there sin in my life that I haven't let go of? Is there something that I haven't repented of? And so we need to take care of these things. We need to deal with these things. So David asked that God would restore him to the joy of God's salvation, the salvation that God had given him. So that tells me that for a period of time, as he was struggling with the sin he committed, he was robbed of joy. But again, that, joy, that, that lack of joy brought to remembrance the necessity for his relationship with God. When he came into that, back to that relationship with God, joy was restored. 
And remember the Apostle Peter telling God what he was going to do, telling Christ that he was going to die for him. And when he couldn't do what he thought he could do, he was robbed of his joy. And what did he tell everybody else? I'm going fishing. Not that fishing is a sin, but it was for him. That's not what God desired of him. God called him out of that. He was to be a fisher of men. But the Lord met him in the midst of it. And what did he do? He restored joy back to Peter's life, that Peter was very powerful in the hands of God and for the purpose of God. The Apostle John has given us four basic reasons why we are to be joyful. The first one is in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Know that your joy is based upon he who is of eternity past and he who is of eternity future. Eternity past, he was and he always has been. He's created everything that we see. He's created the moments that we live in. He's created time and all of these things but also, an equally important, eternity future. Understand who holds your life in his hand today is the one who exists in tomorrow, or he exists in this coming week. And that was kind of our prayer with Jim's heart donor. God, that you would make this man aware, because God knew the day of that man's death. And and God knew that that the day of that man's death was coming, And we were brought into that. And God spoke to my heart through that. And that God knows that this man is going to... Now, we didn't know that it was going to be a week or a month, but looking back, as we were praying last Sunday here for Jim, but also for the person that was going to be the heart donor, and we prayed for him during our noon prayer as well, God knew that that person was dying on Friday morning. God knew that that was going to happen. Now, I'm not bringing death into the equation of your life because that's not good for church growth. But the good things, the hard things, God's well aware of. And once again, a reminder. So today, you have the confidence, and it should bring joy into your heart. You're entering in into this coming week of that which God has prepared for you. If God exists in eternity, which he does, then God is already doing a work. He's a personal God in your life, even right now, for your future. And again, so that tells me that future isn't just some darkness that I'm entering into. It's not some unknown, because it is known by God. It's just unknown to me. But what does the just do? The just lives by faith. And so we're moving into tomorrow and to next week by faith. I've got my week pretty much planned out next week. I've got a lot going on next week but I'm not sure that that's all that God has for me. Does he have more? Does he have less? And so we make our plans, but it's God who directs our steps. And we need to be open to the leading of the Lord. When these things happen, and we find joy. Joy is not based upon any person in my life. People come and go. It's not based upon my bank account. Money goes more than it comes. Or it's not based upon possessions. Things break and are discarded. My joy is based upon my eternal security in Jesus Christ that nobody can snatch me out of his hand. Secondly, know that the reason for your joy is based upon eyewitness accounts. Again, what John says here in verse 1, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. These things are not based upon opinion, story, or thought. They're based upon personal experiences. I've been religious all of my life or up to the day of my salvation and before I had been religious but when I heard somebody preaching the word of God who had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ it made all of the difference now that person didn't say I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and I just believe them I could see the personal relationship with Jesus Christ I could tell that that person spent time with the Lord And again, it was that witness that resonated true in my life and made a huge difference and so that the word as it was delivered entered into my life and I in turn could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If I believe of the existence of God and I believe that Christ dwells inside of me and I believe that that came about through somebody else speaking the word, 
the only way that my joy is going to be maintained is I in turn am that witness that God has called me to be. To live this Christian life to its fullness in all of the details to the best of my ability. Number three, verse two, God, motivated by love, revealed himself to us for the express purpose of our joy. This life was manifest or revealed, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. And so uh, John's making this point. God has revealed himself to you, skipping down to verse 4, that your joy may be full. This is a reality, needs to be a reality, should be a reality, in your Christian life is the revelation of Jesus Christ and the revelation of Jesus Christ. What was the result? There's only going to be two results of the revelation of Jesus Christ. To the goats, it's going to be conviction and it's going to be fear. And when I say fear, I mean fright. It's an awful thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Or to the born-again believer, I have joy in the presence of the Lord because he's offered us eternal life. And as we have received it again, we have become his child. And so as far as the revelation of Christ through God's word, there's either going to be the, the, the goat or, or the sheep. And so which are, are you? We need to know. We need to make sure. And if you don't have joy in the knowledge of the revelation of Jesus Christ, that means you're not of the Lord. If you have joy even though you're an imperfect person, because you realize the grace of God, then you know that you are his. John chapter 20, verse 31, the gospel of John, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And the life that we have, again, is an abundant, joyful life. And then fourthly, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The most neglected thing in, in Christianity is fellowship, is fellowship with one another. True Christian joy is how we are kept through fellowship with one another. Who wants to go to a place where everybody's always bummed out? Who wants to go to a place where people are depressed all the time? Well, if everything that I'm saying is true, ought this place not to be filled with joy? I I mean, when we come to the realization of these things in in our personal lives, when the worship team is up here and leading us in worship, ought there not to be an expression of joy? An expression of joy that spills out into the lives around us so that, again, joy resonates from this place. And so my question to you is, are you doing your part? Are you doing your part as a believer? Are, 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 you, are you open to the leading of the Spirit through this time of worship that joy would be built up? And he's going, again, joy is not just because of the music or the singer or the song or whatever it might be. It just is based upon the work that God has done in your heart and the expectation of what God wants to do through the preaching of his word even one more time. Hebrews says it's the best, our go-to-church verse, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, it says, and let us consider one another, now listen to this, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. It's not saying that the pastor has to do all of this, it's what we do with one another as we encourage one another. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, we've experienced that. Hey, whatever happened to so-and-so, you don't see so-and-so any, anymore. And I guarantee you, so-and-so is not experiencing a joyful Christian life. He says, but exhort one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So, talking about the gathering together of the brethren, that's the literal meaning of the word church. The gathering together for encouragement, especially as we see the day of trial and tribulation approaching, especially as we see the signs of the times as we see in the second coming of Christ approaching, especially as we see the state of the world and all the things that are going on in there, that people would know that God is still moving, that people would know that that God still cares, that people would still know that there is joy in this Christian life. 
And so John, John writes this epistle that we're starting upon, started it actually a couple of weeks ago, and he has got reason and purpose. In chapters 1 through 3, the conditions which are essential before this joy can be obtained and remain in us. Chapters 4 and chapter 5, verse 12, he exhorts us to practice the principles that he has laid down. You must do these things. Blessed are you if you do these things. And in chapter 5, verse 13, to the end, are the truths he draws from his conclusion. The study of God's word should result in realities in and through our lives. They should result in the realities of things in and through your life so that we are able to experience these things together as well. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So in closing, what is Christian joy? First of all, what Christian joy is not, it's that which is not based upon the world. Again, as I said earlier, it's not about happiness because that's emotion-driven. Joy is spirit-driven. Death and financial, financial issues, health issues, whatever it might be, they will rob you of your happiness, but my joy, again, is supernaturally given to me by God. When we went into that hospital room yesterday, it was anything but depressing. It was anything but sad. It's hard to see my brother like that, but there was just joy. And that's the thing that has hit me, and God has used in my life to minister to me with Jim and this heart transplant, is just the love that God has for this man, that he was allowed this surgery to happen, that this surgery could possibly happen. And I see Jim there on that bed, and I see this man who is breathing and who is alive and who God has kept, and I'm just thinking, man, God's got a reason and purpose for this. And it's just joy in seeing the hand of God. And even D, you know, Jim, since last February, has been in the hospital for 60 days. He's been in and out, but he's been in the hospital for 60 days. Guess who's been with him? Well, the Lord, but also his wife. And, and she's there, and she will, you know, she's a nurse, and she's got joy as well. And so we just see the goodness of God in his people. If, if it was just about happiness, if it was just about feelings and all of that, if it was apart from God, how could you possibly experience joy in such a situation? Martin Lloyd-Jones says, as Christian people, we have no right to be in a state of melancholy or unhappiness because the world is as it is. Well, the world is passing away, but we are kept forever in Jesus Christ. Christian joy, Christian joy, as I said earlier, is not to be stoic. It's just not that you need to endure, but you need to just absorb everything. I, I went to a graduation uh, last, um, it was Thursday morning. It was my grandson, Henry. He graduated from kindergarten. <laughs> and the kid, the kid is just a sponge. He, he's just sucking it all in, just the whole experience and, and all the things that he has learned and all of these things. And he's just joyful about these, this life and how this life has opened up before him. Do you have that joy in your Christian life as well? the learning and the knowledge of the Lord, and how God moves and interacts within our lives. Again, how he has given us all things to enjoy and how he has opened up eternity before us. We are not to be spiritual eors. We are to be salt. We are to be lights, witnesses, and vessels of the Holy Spirit to those who are lost. That being said, thirdly, Christian joy is to have no fear in this life. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And the idea is, is don't become overwhelmed by whatever the situation and circumstance is because God is greater than whatever that is that could possibly torment you. What Christian joy is, well, in a New Testament sense, it is a state of mind which is the result of interactions within a relationship with Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and the knowledge of God working upon your soul. It's the reality of the knowledge that God's word was written to me personally, written to you personally as well, and it's there to be partaken of. 
It's the knowledge that God watches over me, and he will never leave me nor forsake me. As we will with a child, as a child's learning to walk, sometimes we'll take our hands off him because he needs to develop that sense of balance and that we're not going to always be there holding his hands. He needs to mature. He needs to learn to walk by himself but in our oversight. And it's the same thing with God. On that day you were saved, God had you by the hands, but he has let go of your hands. Not that he has forsaken you, he hasn't, he's always there. And God enables us to do all that he's called, but still he wants us to mature in our Christian life. When we come to the realization, and we come to the understanding of these things, joy is going to spring up in our lives. If we ignore these things, or we remain ignorant to these things, then we just become an old wineskin church in which there is no joy whatsoever. The Apostle Paul, in the book of Philippians, he was in a Roman dungeon. He was in that place where you can complain. And, well, like I told the, uh, I, I spoke at one of the main sessions at the pastor's conference, and I told them, and the church doesn't even know this, but I have a wine problem. I have an issue with wine. Not the drinking kind, but the complaining kind. Sometimes I whine about this, and sometimes I whine about that. Well, I look at the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul was in a place where he could really go off on the whining, but he didn't. Matter of fact, read the epistle of Philippians. It's all about joy. It's all about joy. And, and, and there's, there's five things, just real quick, that he brought up that his joy is based upon. And first is the joy of remembrance. The remembrance of everything that God has done, how God has used him, how God has saved him, and the state he was in when God saved him, and God has brought him to a great place, a great place in the kingdom of God, even though, again, he's sitting in a dungeon. It, what else brought joy to his life? The joy of intercessory prayer. Because whenever Paul was thrown into jail, Paul was praying and penning. He, he was always, you just couldn't stop him. Wherever he was, he kept going. He kept pressing forward. And so it brought him joy to think of the people that came to faith, and he would pray for those people. What also brought him joy was fellowship, even if it's this ugly Roman that I'm chained to right here because he saw, and it filled his heart with joy, I got an opportunity to minister to somebody, and he can't get away from me. He thought, the guard thought that Paul was chained to him, when in actuality, he was chained to Paul. And then there was the joy of his assurance. He who began a good work in me is going to be faithful to complete it. He's going to bring it to completion. Completion is to be in his presence. And then lastly, there was joy of brotherly love. Brotherly love, the people who were praying for him, the support that he had, his church, and, and the goodness, the good things that he found as he gathered together with the brethren. Paul also wrote in Romans chapter 8, I'm actually going to start reading in verse 35. I think it says 31 up on the board. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Remember, there's a question asked. So the easy answer, we shouldn't have to read any further, is no one. But since I'm a pastor, and I said in closing, so that means i got about another hour. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, we're told in Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is love. And part of that fruit of the Spirit of the um, the fruit of love is joy. Who will separate us from, from joy, tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness or peril or sword? Skipping down to verse 37. Yet in all of these things, in all of the difficulties of life, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. How can you be more than a conqueror? That means you fight, you enter into the battle from the standpoint of already achieving victory. So as I said earlier, we're entering into what God has already prepared for us. You're more than a conqueror. You've already conquered anything that can come up against you. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, that means anything else in this world, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the thing that should bring joy to your heart, that's not separation from the love that you have for God. That's separation. Nothing can separate you from the love 
that God has for you. Amen? Father, once again, we just thank you, Lord, that you have given us this day. And God, just the great assurances that you give us through your word. And Father, I pray, Lord, that everybody in this room, everybody that hears this message would personalize this. God, that we would realize the goodness that you have, not just for the church, not just for the born-again believer, not just for us, but for me. And God, I would embrace these things, and God, these things would go before me, and they would give me a confidence, especially in the hardships that are, that are truly to come before us. And so, Lord, we just thank you, Father, that you have thought of everything. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us, that you would fill us with your spirit for your purposes. And God, we just pray that we would be able to experience all the joy that you have for us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We all stand, please? Last Sunday of May, that means Vacation Bible School is coming upon us. Our VBS is going to be, I believe it's July 5th.